you don't have to worry about is this application fully instrumented with this, you know, open telemetry or some, a new approach. Logs are ubiquitous. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 201. Getting to the root cause with Zebrium. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Imagine this, or maybe you don't have to imagine it because you've lived it. You get a call at 2.30 in the morning. All your alarms are going off. And then all of a sudden, your boss calls you. And then you have to wake up other people. We have to get everybody in the war room. We have to get everybody on a call. Let me just fast forward through this. You go to take a look at the logs. And you notice the logs aren't moving. And then you start thinking, well, what's going on? We never have any problems with this machine. And then you run DFH. And you see zero. Victor? How many times has that happened to you? Zero times that I'm willing to admit. Admit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me give you a different version of that. How many times have you done RM-RF in your life? Quite a few times. Just, just in general. Just in general. On purpose, yes. No, 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 I'm not talking about this specific yet, but just how many times do you think you've done RM-RF? Hundreds. Hundreds of thousands of times probably, right? Maybe not how many times of you thousands, done RM? thousands, let's say, yes. Thousands, okay. And how many times have you done RM-RF slash? Depends whether I'm willing to admit now again or no. <laughs> how, many, how many times have you done sudo RM-RF slash? Quite a few times. I've done that twice yeah. in my life on production systems. I will admit it. Both of those, those were the root causes. Right? It wasn't all the other things that was going on. It wasn't network. It was. It may have been manifesting itself as other things, but the root cause was out of disk, or in my case, RMRF, no files left on disk. It was the exact opposite. That was really freeing up a lot of space. So on today's show, we have Ajay Singh on from Zebrium. Ajay, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Now, of course, I was sort of making up some very contrived examples, or not so contrived examples. What has your life been like when you get down and you know you get that call? What has that been like in your life? <laughs> well, I've come up the, the ranks in the in the infrastructure space, data storage systems, and that's a domain of the enterprise where uptime, availability, reliability are extremely valuable, yeah, highly prized. Anytime there was a problem or an outage or a warning or a bug that a customer was impacted by, it became all hands on deck. <laughs> it's a problem my co-founders have lived more intimately than I have on a daily basis. But needless to say, anytime there was a significant escalation, management teams, product managers, all the way up to the CEO would be in the loop and then increasingly worried and checking on it. So. The exact scenario you pointed out, disk full, yeah, that's one that uh, we've encountered many times in my career, I'd say. I want to stay there for just a second where you, where you were starting. You start getting management and then upper management, and depending on how deep your organization is, upper, upper management, and everybody's got their eyeballs on it. And they're wanting updates every 30 seconds. How is somebody supposed to actually try to resolve the incident when they're always giving status reports every 30 seconds? 
Yeah, the the life of a frontline escalation engineer or a troubleshooter is 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 why it's there's some similarities to someone on a trading floor. You have to be able to uh, assimilate a lot of data, think fast, and deal with a lot of pressure at the same time. Uh, now, of course, you know, in mature organizations they learn not to pester the frontline engineer every thirty seconds because that, that actually hinders the outcome. Uh, but you do feel the pressure of someone looking over your shoulder the entire time. This is why anything that can make your life easier, any tools, any process, of course, having the best skilled uh, staff, it's a premium. It's, a, it's, it's highly valued. So anything that gets you good outcomes, more reliable outcomes, faster, people will be willing to invest a ton in that. Your your instincts are, are, are well founded. It's a it's a hard job to be, in, and, and it's not just your management staff. What puts even more pressure on you is you're probably on the phone with the customer, and if there's a significant business impact or downtime, they're feeling the pressure from their boss, and and it, there's this added feeling of you know responsibility and accountability that you're 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 making their lives harder, and, and you're trying to do the best you can to, to get them back in a healthy state. In my scenarios, I was playing out, it was almost like I was shooting from the hip and really didn't have processes. Now, we know most people have some sort of process to go into, but the problem is those processes may be outdated. They may have never even run those processes before just because the person that used to run the processes left, retired, whatever. Thinking now in 2023, what are some basic processes? If people don't have any processes at all, like they're coming in, maybe they're a newbie right out of university and they just got dumped into the pit with everybody else and they're just managing things. Forget about DevOps. They're just straight up ops or SREs. And there's nothing really there. Right? They're chasing logs all day long. What should they start at first? You know, the, the domain has matured sufficiently, although... You know, uh, cloud native applications or modern application sort of development paradigms are still relatively young. It's been happening long enough that people have actually written books on it and disciplines like you know DevOps and SRE have developed around it, best practices and, and tools. So if I were starting life as a new company with a new cloud native application, the first couple of things I would put in place is some basic monitoring that keeps an eye on the fundamental sort of health indicators of the application. And Google actually did write the book on this, you know, to monitor the golden signals, they say. Things like error rate, saturation, latency, because those are the things your users will care about. At a minimum, that's a good starting point. And it turns out most organizations just do that much because anything beyond that, it is just too hard for reasons I can explain to build more intelligence. So the thinking is, if you can at least be aware when something goes wrong and you have all the underlying data at your disposal, you'll have the ability to then drill down and figure out why things are going wrong. But for, for reasons I can explain, it's hard to go beyond that. I feel like in big part is that because companies try, at least those that I work with, they try very hard to Define the processes, which is great, but they try to do it very often in advance, right? I rarely see those processes being continuously improved through incidences because when things like what Darren described happened, most of the people are focused on how to fix it, not how to fix it and incorporate it into the playbooks or whatever they're, people are using, right? Right, and and the, so let me let me get into it. My co-founders, you know, basically built systems for two decades that used to be called you know predictive monitoring systems. So they used to go beyond the approach I just described, where you're just looking at the health of the uh, at the symptoms at the you know is the application up or down? Are people experiencing unusual slowdowns? Twenty years ago. People used to try and go beyond that. They used to build diagnostic alerts. 
So it wouldn't just tell you that latency is high, it would actually try and tell you latency is high because you're seeing these events and these metrics that are beyond their normal state and you're getting these log messages. And you would build databases of these health checks. So as anytime you encountered a problem, you would know not just that you have a problem, but what the problem was and what to do about it. And then you could logically take the next step to build some round books or remediations and maybe even trigger them. There's two reasons that approach has sort of fallen down or, or fallen out of favor over the last you know, 10, 15 years. Applications have become far more complex, you know, where you might have had a s- simple monolithic application 15 years ago, front end, middleware, database, server, storage, network, maybe with you know a dozen log files to keep an eye on. Maybe it can go wrong a hundred ways or a few hundred ways. It's actually feasible to be aware of every possible way the application breaks and build a diagnostic rule to uniquely identify when that happens, which then allows you to quickly take the right action or maybe even automate the right action. The, this was also helped by the fact that the applications didn't change that often. You know, people used to do quarterly software releases, and maybe you had, you know, if you the the more mission critical the application was, the less frequently you would change it. Maybe maybe only once a year you would allow major updates. The, the relatively bounded complexity and number of failure modes, combined with the relatively slow pace of change allowed you to become a lot more intelligent about both catching problems, knowing what was going wrong, and maybe automating outcomes. Now, as you know, two of those underlying factors have changed drastically. An application today is far more likely to be based on Kubernetes, you know, a few dozen microservices, each one developed by a different team, operating at their own different cadence, and when things go wrong, it's no longer a few hundred ways that things can go wrong. It could be tens of thousands of ways. And the rate of change is no longer managed, it is no longer measured in weeks or months. It's, it's measured in hours. So if you invested a lot of effort building smart diagnostic alert rules and run books for those particular failure scenarios, by the time you're done building that rule and testing it and putting it in your monitoring stack, the software's changed sufficiently that that rule will probably be obsolete in, in, in a couple of weeks. If you talk to teams that actually are responsible for you know, observability strategies, uh, as well as triage, troubleshooting, uh, remediation, it's all about just knowing something is wrong and then having all the data at your disposal quickly building a war room, a Slack workspace, diving into it, and then triaging it manually on the, f- on the fly. If it's a very serious problem, you might be very diligent about doing a root cause analysis, a post-mortem, because there might be lessons to be learned. But chances are you're not going to build very sophisticated alerts or diagnostics to catch the same problem in the future, because one, you're going to hit 10 new problems in the next month. And your software itself will change enough that any rule you built today, you can't be confident it's going to be actually reliable in a few weeks. So that's how people used to do it. And those are the two reasons they don't invest as much in you know what used to be called predictive alerts or diagnostic alerts. I think one of the things you said there at the beginning was latency is increasing. That's useless without the because. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a end to one many, many reasons could cause latency to increase. Um, Many reasons could cause your CPU to peg at 100%. Knowing those symptoms is just the starting point, which which has value because at least you can get to work before your your company's name starts to show up on Down Detector or, or on Twitter. So it gives you a little bit of a head start, but it doesn't actually tell you much about what what went wrong i can go further and tell you what we've seen from dozens of organizations and what what the classic workflow is but yes you 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 hit on one of the reasons why people don't try to get too too cute with these uh database rules because the the 
complexity of factors that could lead to the same symptom is just staggering. Instead of trying to monitor the root causes, they just try to monitor the symptom and that the human figured out the root cause. Well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and give a few concrete examples because it's the stories that we love to uh, hear and hope that we never run into. <laughs> yeah, so let me start with the, you know, the general philosophy that we see these days. And, and people are following the, you know, the, the Google uh, SRE uh, handbook, which is monitor your golden signals. But do collect the metrics, do collect the logs, and do collect, if the application is instrumented in such a way, do collect the traces as well. The, the classic workflow we see from people is when they become aware of a problem, one of these golden signals is out of bounds, they will try and use their dashboards and their metrics to first narrow down the time frame. Okay, when did this problem start? Is it still going on? So if it's a latency uh, spike, you'll notice at what point in time did the latency start climbing? And that's maybe the beginning of your problem period. Uh, if your CPUs started going, you know, 200%, again, watching that on a chart gives you an idea of where the problem started, when. If the application is well traced, you might then use your tracing tools to narrow down which components or which microservices is the problem visible in. So that sort of narrows down the the you know the domains and maybe the subset of the organization that needs to focus on the problem. I should say some obvious problems. This may these two may be all you need. If it's a very obvious, you know, well, CPUs all all the CPUs hundred percent. It's probably because you don't have enough EC2 instances, so you need your auto scaling isn't working or something. Again, if it's um, it's a very obvious problem, like one microservice is completely down, the tracing might itself lead you to the root cause. But more often than not, these two will just give you the when and the where. And to know the why, why did the problem happen? What's the root cause? You need to look at an event workspace, which is you know, classically found in the logs. Uh, for, for a couple of reasons, logs are a, a very rich and ubiquitous pool of data for troubleshooting. Uh, one reason is everything generates logs. Pretty much any piece of software in the world generates logs because when the developers started coding that piece of software, they maybe they didn't know how it was going to piece together with other applications. Maybe they were just writing a simple utility or a microservice. But for their own productivity, they probably put in enough messages to, to troubleshoot when they were developing. So you don't have to worry about, is this application fully instrumented with this you know, open tail entry or some, a new approach? Logs are ubiquitous. The second reason people find logs so useful for troubleshooting is they're very specific, meaning they tend to map to a very particular part of the code. Unlike metrics, which are a sampled time series measurement, a log event generally comes from a specific part of the code. It's it's where the developer put in a printf, let's say. So you read the message, you pretty much know which part of the code it's coming from. So that if you see a sequence of log messages, you can sort of piece together the sequence in which the application executed, which parts of the code were exercised when that problem manifested. And the third reason is, again, developers for their own benefit put in some semantic context. Logs aren't just numbers. There will be some words in there. There will be some phrases. They might be very terse, but they're actually very, very well selected by the developer uh, because it helps them distinguish this particular issue from you know a hundred other issues they might have in their code. So that when when a problem is having to be troubleshot in, in real life in, under production, you will find the, the text of the log message itself useful. These three properties of logs are things that we take advantage of, uh, the company Zebrium, and this is the reason we invested a lot of machine learning IP in how to extract root cause from this rich and valuable source of data, i.e. logs. But to step back, the workflow I shared with you, you know, narrow down using metrics in the time domain, narrow down using traces, 
in the horizontal domain where, where the problem is isolated, and then look at the logs to figure out the why, is roughly what we see most people do. What do you do when a developer puts bad things in the logs, like passwords and doing things that they just weren't thinking straight? I put this in for debug, right? You know, it printed out the full social security number, or home address, mother's maiden name, the whole thing. And it's like, uh, okay, now what do we do? Yeah, it, it's it's a undesirable but not entirely unknown scenario. You know, you want example, you know, other examples are, you know, PII or even more benign things like a host name, you know, the, the depending on the nature of your organization and your software, any of these could be cons- considered very sensitive and, you know, uh, risky. And this is a reason log analytics is still not completely <laughs> SaaS based. So the world is moving to SaaS. Uh, monitoring companies are heavily, uh, the, their SaaS adoption rates are very, very skewed, very high. But the same monitoring companies also support traces and also support logs. And you'll often find that the log feed, the the largest enterprises, particularly in tech, government, uh, healthcare, and financial services, the enterprise is not sending their logs to a SaaS vendor. They are maintaining those in-house and perhaps running the same analytics tools in-house. There are technologies that try to detect these sensitive data categories and, and um, expunge them from the logs. Uh, but if you ask you know, a, a real security expert, there is no foolproof way to assure that your logs are free of sensitive information. It's just one of those unfortunate facts of life. If you have thousands of engineers, there's a chance some will exercise poor judgment or make a mistake and inadvertently leave something in the logs that's sensitive in nature. The, the answer to that is if, if, if you're one of those organizations where that's a material risk, you may not let the logs leave your network. So whatever magic, whatever analysis you need to do, you'll try and do it within your network. So I want to go back to my earlier example of no space left on device. In a Kubernetes world, obviously that could still happen. But probably, unless you've got Autoscaler turned on, uh, you could run out of pod space. What are other types of of those scenarios are you seeing now in cloud native? Oh, <laughs> the world of uh, failure mode <laughs> in cloud native is 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 um, well, maybe not unbounded, but it's pretty vast. You know, some of the examples we see are in, in the in the container management it, it, domain itself. Kubernetes itself has some well known sort of pathological failure modes. Often to do, not not because the technology itself has bugs, but the DevOps engineer or the engineers made a mistake when they were setting up the application. They didn't get all the scaling quite right, or they didn't give it enough, a big enough pool of resources, or you know, some components of the stack are you know, running an older version, pods being accidentally deleted, pods not being able to spin up, uh, running out of resources, running out of space, running out of um, uh, CPU memory, are not unknown. Almost every cloud native application has a has a data pipeline, and we see a lot of problems in in those areas. So you know, Kafka broker keeps keeps rebooting, or my Redis uh, containers keep restarting, or they keep run, giving me out of memory uh, messages, or my database has sporadic connectivity issues, or connections keep uh, hitting their limits, or you know, my, my MongoDB cluster, some some nodes didn't upgrade to the right version. Another area that's rich is interactions with third-party services. So you're probably using some cloud-native services as well. And there are often API authentication issues, rate limit failures, again, version version mismatch issues. These are all pretty common in any complex or large-scale cloud-native application. And then, of course, there's software bugs. And not all bugs uh, impact, you know, those four golden metrics we talked about at the beginning, like user latency. In fact, the vast majority of bugs will only cause unexpected outcomes or weird error messages in a very, very specific action by the user. So they actually tend to be even trickier to catch. 
because it won't cause site-wide metrics to, to go out of bounds. So to answer your question, those are sort of the classic categories we see, you know, the uh, container management itself, resource management, data pipeline, interactions with third-party services, and then bugs within your code itself. It's almost as if the bugs are the very last thing on the list, literally, right? I mean, you said it that way, but to me, it, unless I have all those other things taken care of, my bugs really don't matter. Yeah, and, and you know, a, a, a way to think about it is bugs are more bounded. Most bugs, you know, of course, if it's a bug that causes your application to crash, it probably falls under one of the other categories. But when I say bugs, I mean bugs that are very isolated to specific actions, clicks, user journeys. And you're right, yeah, those those tend to be lower on the priority list because they rarely result in P1s. They may irritate the heck out of the, the user who's trying out your latest feature, but, you know, the rest of the application is probably still okay. So, you know, it sort of falls into the P2, P3 bucket most of the time. What's been one of the most strangest causes that you've seen get bubbled out? I don't know if there's anything that, that particularly stands out as strange. The, the ones the ones we've enjoyed, <laughs> and I, I use this term sort of enjoyed? carefully. Uh, really? The, the ones, well, as a, as a technology provider that helps customers um, troubleshoot problems, and this is our focus. On the one hand, we empathize with the customer who's dealing with a hard problem, but on the other hand, if they've been beating their heads against a wall for 24 hours and then they hook up our machine learning and we help them find the root cause in 10 minutes, there's a certain element of validation, but also some you know pleasure in helping solve a problem that was so hard for them to solve. It's often very unexpected things like an expired certificate, or you know, my DNS service was out, and n no, none of the developers was thinking about this. Or you know, the open source object storage software we use, some developer had upgraded to the newest version, and it's introduced a new bug. And again, none of our validations, or none of our testing, was even thinking about that. It's not so much the bug as the as the the stories about how painful it was to troubleshoot that make some of these stand out in my mind. And those tend to be the stories, almost any kind of situation where a SaaS application is degraded or down for hours is going to be an interesting story. One of our customers had a 24 hour outage once because of that said um, object storage problem. And they were using tools like Elastic and some other monitoring tools to try and troubleshoot the problem. But the volumes of data and the complexity of the application was so vast, it wasn't the speed of the tool, it wasn't the intuitiveness of the query language of the tool that was the bottleneck. The bottleneck was the humans not knowing where to start because they had no clue where the problem originated. And that's what we, those are the kinds of problems we enjoy really solving because that that's that's a classic application for machine learning is when the human doesn't know where to start, uh, getting them very close to the root cause is, is, a, is a perfect application um, for, our, for, for machine learning. And that's, those are the stories that uh, sort of uh, <laughs> have a place in my, in my heart. <laughs> Although the, the eventual root cause wasn't that exotic. I mean, I gave you the examples, you know, certificate expired, DNS service down, well, object storage had a new version. API mismatches. One of our customers is dealing with private APIs from one of the big cloud vendors. And the cloud vendor doesn't feel super obligated to maintain backwards compatibility or update documentation in a timely manner. So they run into API version mismatch issues on a monthly basis at least, maybe not daily, but at least on a monthly basis. And they have told us time and time again that our tool catches those mismatch issues, which eventually have ripple effects throughout their application stack. And again, I don't know that that's super exotic, but it's a kind of problem we enjoy solving because there's no other easy ways to solve it. Well, I hear two things there. First off, it's always DNS. <laughs> for, always. Number two, your client shouldn't be using private APIs. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, it's whoever you are, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, there, there's certain business models where, it, for example, uh, one of our customers it, is a cost optimization company. So they'll tell you how to minimize your AWS spend by shifting between reserved instances, pod instances, instance types, and so forth. For whatever reason, the only way to get access to that information is through private APIs. They exist, but the cloud vendors don't. You know, maybe because it's not important or maybe because they don't want people to have <laughs> access to that information too easily. Those are just painful. So if you, if you want to build automation like that, you're sort of forced into dealing with poorly documented private APIs. But yeah, as, as, a, as a common practice, I agree with you that you know you're asking for trouble when you do that. Okay, putting that aside. So Zebrium was actually recently acquired by ScienceLogic Back in October of 2022, correct? That's correct, yes. And looking at the site, Zebrium, it's Z-E-B-R-I-U-M.com. If you take a look at the line, you've heard us talk about root cause this whole time. Your tagline is root cause as a service. How did you come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Um if you don't mind, this is a longer answer. So let me let me dive Take right Take a deep breath. It. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> stretch it out. Okay, go ahead. All right. So what do we mean by root cause first? And then, and then I'll get to the as a service part next. So that methodology I described to you earlier, how, how do most monitoring slash DevOps slash SRE teams troubleshoot, you know, narrow down using metrics, narrow down using traces, and then dig into the logs to figure out why. It turns out that, that that last bit, it's not new. People have been troubleshooting software the same way since the 70s, probably, if not even earlier. Now, exactly how you, you do that, there's a little bit of art to it. It's not easy to fully automate this. What a skilled engineer will do when you ask them, how do you troubleshoot using logs? They'll tell you, well, I'll first look for places where there was lots of errors or warnings. That sort of centers, you know, where the symptoms really started to, to show up. But that's usually not the root cause. What I'll do then is try to move upstream from that and figure out well, what changed before that. Was there something unusual in the environment? Was there some change, a new deployment, a new version perhaps? Did an administrator or a user take some actions, change some settings? Or was there some weird warnings from some related software component in the environment that gives me a clue as to you know what triggered these errors that I see. It's actually not hard to, to spot spikes in errors. Many tools can do that. It turns out to be much harder to find the outlier or the unusual or the weird thing. Skilled engineers just develop good instincts for spotting those outliers. They just develop enough familiarity with their application stack and with typical message patterns that they're able to spot these weird outliers faster than the, uh, a newbie. But skilled engineers have one other, I should call it, skill set or a sixth sense. They're able to correlate cause and effect better than most. And that skill is becoming more and more important because you're no longer dealing with a monolithic application where the cause and effect are likely to be in the same log file. And that might have been the case 15 years ago. Today, it's more likely that you're having to look across thousands of log streams. Maybe you can narrow down some using tracing and monitoring, but ultimately you're still looking across a very vast space of log events. And the cause may ripple from you know your CID, CICD system, to some one component and then to another component, maybe in the database layer, ultimately affecting your front end you know, UI services. And to be able to traverse across all of these, if you had fully instrumented everything with traces, that might have helped, but often you're using components that, that aren't fully traced. And as really good engineers has a sixth sense for spotting connections between weird events in one space and errors in a different space. But it turns out 
these three things are also things that machine learning can be taught to do. Certainly, machine learning can easily spot you know, spikes and errors or warnings or alerts. That's easy. That's In fact, that's trivial. You can code that up as a rule in Elastic or Splunk. A little bit harder is to classify and understand the normal event patterns of your application stack so that outliers can be detected. We often see the, the term anomaly detection being applied to that problem. Anomaly detection is very easy for time series data, or I shouldn't say very, it's, it's a lot easier for time series data because it's just a matter of spotting spikes or a gradual plateau. There's a few different ways that you can detect anomalies in time series data. It's far more subtle and far trickier in log events because the catalog of event types that any application can generate is vast. A, a simple application uh, like the Atlassian suite might generate a thousand unique event types. A more complex application might have tens of thousands of event types. Each of these is being spread out across thousands or tens of thousands of containers or pods. So you've got this vast multiplex of events coming your way. Spotting outliers among that is not an easy task. People have attempted this for at least 10 years with very mixed success. Most tools that attempt anomaly detection end up looking cool, but being pretty useless in real life because in a modern software environment, there's always enough change that you're going to have thousands of anomalies every day. But a good machine learning technique will at least identify them. And then the special sauce is to be able to correlate these anomalies across streams and to say this sequence of unusual events and errors actually is connected. They, they are one sequence and they are the likely root cause report for the problem that occurred at this point in time. And that's essentially what Zebrium does. It took us years to build the software stack, layer by layer, first the log classification, then the outlier detection. The correlation was a really hard one. It took us lots of real-world feedback across hundreds and eventually 2,000 incidents to refine that. And then to be able to summarize it down to the point a human being can easily consume it. So that's what we mean by root cause, and, and it's now been validated by Fortune 100 enterprises across large um, data sets of real-world production incidents as being very accurate. Cisco uses us for a variety of product lines, and they found almost 96% of the time, we will find the same root cause indicators from within the logs that a very skilled engineer would have found after spending hours on the problem. Except, of course, machine learning can do that within minutes. So that's what we mean by root cause. Let me pause because I was going to then move on to the as a service part. But feel free for you to interject if there's anything that didn't make sense in my long-winded explanation so far. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm interested to hear the as a service part. Yeah. So, so once we got to this point where we could create this concise root cause reports and they were fairly accurate, we had to figure out, well, how, how do you make this easily consumable? by a real-world user, because their eyeballs are probably in a monitoring dashboard today. Perhaps it's a Grafana dashboard, or Datadog, or New Relic, or Elastic, or, or an APM dashboard. And then when they're trying to do their triage and their war rooms, they're probably in some Slack workspace or an incident management tool like PagerDuty or whatever. And then eventually the developer might be looking at the logs, but there's no way to tie those insights back. If you want to automate this, it's not good enough to have a sort of a, a split in your workflow tree to say, okay, you keep doing your monitoring your incident management the way we were, but at this point, take a break and go off and start looking at this entirely new tool. Look up the loop cause report, copy and paste it back into your incident management or triage workflows. That's how we started. And we found introducing a new tool which doesn't map to you know the classic workflows of an SRE or a DevOps engineer or even a developer just made it very hard 
even though the accuracy is very high, it made it very hard to operationalize in your day-to-day -day life. So people would only go to our tool when they had a very hard problem uh, and the rest of the time they would just default to their traditional workflows. So then we had this insight. Our software is very efficient. It's very lightweight. We don't retain logs for the long term. We just analyze real-time streams. We construct very lightweight root cause reports. We had started to post those reports automatically into incident management tools like PagerDuty and OpsGenie. And then somebody had, our CTO had this insight. Well, if, if the SREs are looking at the monitoring dashboard all day, they're seeing that spike on the dashboard. Instead of relying on them to break their workflow and go you know, log into a different tool and look at the right time frame and look up the root cause report and then copy and paste, why not give them APIs which would allow them to place the root cause report on the very same monitoring dashboard right below that spike where the latency uh, you know, caught their eye. So that is essentially the, what the as a service part means. Through a few API key exchanges, we're able to put our root cause reports in almost any context that an engineer or an SRE or, or a DevOps team today consumes their observability or monitoring data or, or their incident management workflows. We completed the APIs and then we did a whole series of integrations in, into New Relic, into Datadog, into Dynatrace, into AppD, OpsGenie, into Jira. So the as a service part means you don't have to switch context. You don't have to learn a new tool. Whether you were a monitoring tool consumer or an incident management tool consumer, if you wished, I wish I, I knew the root cause of this spike or I opened this ticket, I wish the root cause report were already there. We give you an easy way to integrate the root cause report right there. And, and it, it really, literally is very easy if you were integrating this into a bespoke application, you could complete this within a few hours. Of course, if you're using a common tool, we've already done the work for you. That makes sense? It makes total sense. So basically removing the friction, putting the data where everybody's living already, one less dashboard I have to go look at. One less dashboard and one less conceptual jump, you know. I'm, I'm doing my monitoring. Normally, I would have started drilling down into Elastic or Splunk and started hunting. But instead, hey, there's this new tool that promises to show me root cause. Let me remember to log in there. Uh, let me look up the time frame where the spike was, you know, red, set the right filters in this new tool. And oh, there's the root cause report. These last mile problems, as humans get busier <laughs> and have ever increasing workloads, solving these last mile problems becomes even more important. You've got to fit intuitively into their workflow without making them, you know, open a new tool or learn a new tool or, you know, break their normal, comfortable workflow. And it, it seems to pay off in, in much higher adoption. So that was the, that was the notion behind the as a service part. I have one last question before we wrap up. I have to ask it. <laughs> Please. You, you you are saying machine learning or yes. ML the whole yes. time. Yes. You never uttered the two letters AI. Yeah, our, our CTO has a very particular, um, he, he's, he's a stickler for terminology and the term AI is, <laughs> is overused. He does not want to make claims that will be, uh, you know, sort of smirked at by a true AI expert. Uh, what we have truly is a machine learning solution. It has certain pre-built models. The models rely on the, the way software traditionally breaks and the way skilled engineers typically troubleshoot problems. The models encapsulate those. The parameters for the models are trained uh, using unsupervised learning on the fly in, in each application context. But we still think this is a machine learning model. It's not deep learning. It's not AI. It's, you know... We, we had built the, the model ahead of, ahead of time. And there's always a, the temptation to oversell what you're doing, but we find our, our users and our customers tend to be deeply technical people. We find the, the benefit of overselling is more than overcome by the, you know, the, the disappointment when they, when they see, well, this isn't truly AI. So that's why we, we, don't, we don't overclaim 
oh, what it is that we do. And everybody breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Okay, so this is Zebrium, Z-E-B-R-I-U-M dot com. Jay, if people wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, um, we make it very easy. So if you go to zebrium.com, there's, of course, uh, you can you can create a free trial account for 30 days and, and try it for yourself uh, just by clicking a button. But if you really wanted to talk to us, uh, get a demo, ask questions, you know, be be cynical and you know ask us, you know, hard questions. Click click the book a demo button, and you will get a chance to talk to me or one of my co-founders or one of our senior engineers. We don't yet have any salespeople, so you will get to talk to someone who really knows the tool. We often have really really smart conversations with really intelligent, deeply technical people that start off this way. They just click the book a demo button and. Uh, they really didn't want a demo. They just wanted to ask us some hard questions about how the technology works. So that's, I would say that's probably the easiest way. Jay, thanks for being with us today. Of course, appreciate it so much. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. DevOps Paradox.